Well, we have a couple of announcements. For those of you who have programs and uh, don't think we'll no longer need it, if you could leave it at the registration tables, we really appreciate that. Also, a reminder about uh, that we're having a party tonight with the speakers hosted by Dr. Lee Fitzgerald um, in his house, and the directions are on the website. Thank you. Well, now we'll, we will continue with the program, and it is my honor to introduce our next distinguished speaker, Dr. Jorge Soberon. Dr. Soberon received his bachelor's and master's degrees in biology and biogeography from the National University of Mexico and his PhD in theoretical ecology from the Imperial College at the University of London. Currently, he is senior scientist at the Biodiversity Research Center at the University of Kansas and professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Dr. Soberon has authored and co-authored more than 100 scientific papers, chapters, books, and popular articles. His current research is focused on the theory of areas of distribution of species, their integration in biodiversity patterns, and on biodiversity policy. His work is published in top journals such as Science and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, among many others. Dr. Soberon has done an exemplary job in applying ecological theory to biodiversity conservation. For 13 years, he directed Mexico's National Agency on Biodiversity, where he led the creation of an information system that compiles specimen data to help monitor biodiversity. This system is now regarded as one of the best in the world and provided a basis for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is an international organization that encourages free and open access to biodiversity data. Dr. Soberon is currently vice chair of the executive committee of this organization. And in addition, he has served as board member in more than a dozen conservation organizations and research centers around the world, including the advisory board of the National Ecological Observatory Network, the Scientific Advisory Council of the World Conservation Monitoring Center, the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, and the Nature Conservancy, among others. Today, Dr. Soberon will share with us part of his outstanding research and experience in his talk entitled, From Practice to Theory, Areas of Distribution as Policy Building Blocks. Please help me welcome Dr. Soberon. Thank you very much, first, for uh, inviting me to be here with you. Uh, Today, I'm really honored that uh, the grad students uh, decided to, uh, well, put my name forward for this, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, event. Um, what I'm going to talk about is about uh, areas of distribution of species, uh, how areas of distributions can be used for practical purposes, and how to develop this application uh, of, 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 of concept of area distribution to practical needs, a theory was needed, a theory that was inexistent at the beginning of, uh, of this process. And I'm going to provide you with a very personal uh, perspective on, on, on this. It's, uh, I'm going basically to tell you a tale. It's just a tale based on, on facts, but, or mostly, I guess. But uh, it's a story. Um, and in this story first I'm going to talk about who were the users. When I say that, that uh, there was an uh, application, well, who was doing the application? Who was demanding the science that required to be applied? Uh, what questions were they asking? And what was the theory? I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by theory. Uh, and how. As, as, as this evolved and theory m became more mature, more difficult questions being asked, and that required improvements in the theory, and it's very much an ever-growing process. It never ends. What I mean by theory, uh, people mean a lot of things by this word, but what I mean is essentially uh, a set of the way you organize your concept, your hypothesis, your data, 
in order to understand and to predict. Uh, you need to, to first, you have to organize the data and that requires some ideas. Uh, you need to be able to talk about the, the, what you are doing and that also requires a language, a precise language. The, be the more precise, the better, mostly at the, after a, a while. You need to know how to calculate with the data and we, you also need to know how to predict things. In this particular situation I'm going to talk about, the prediction came first, which is interesting. Uh, and the key words I really would like you to keep in mind is uh, abstraction. Theory becomes more and more abstract when it matures. Formalization, that means that you are using formal languages. Less words and more symbols, more diagrams, eventually equations and mathematical uh, rules. And finally, you resort to models. And this is the kind of thing these guys do, I guess. Well, I'm not entirely sure. So in the 90s, uh, I think all the convention on biological diversity was uh, passed. Uh, uh, we, 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 we hear about it uh, this morning. And a lot of agencies were created in those countries that decided to join the convention. Not all of the countries in, in the planet have joined it. There are like three or four which are still not, uh, yeah. Well, uh, Somalia, Kiribati, um, the US, and a couple of others perhaps. Uh, but nevertheless, most of the world is a member, a party of this convention. And, and in many countries, agencies start being created and budgets allocated in Australia, in Costa Rica, uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, the Conavio, uh, organization Mexico was created with a specific purpose of uh, perform an inventory of Mexican biodiversity. Why? Well, the reason is because there are tons of species in Mexico that matter from one perspective or another. Uh, there are nearly 3,000 protected species in the equivalent of the, of the um, uh, Endangered Species Act of the U.S. There are more than 4,000 registered as with medicinal properties, and a lot of them are used actually by people, mostly in the countryside. There are uh, many, many, many registered invasive species. Uh, the, the list, the official list of fisheries uh, species is 600, more than 600. Uh, forestry species, mostly non-timber forest products, 500, and so on. There are thousands and thousands of species of some importance or another in the country. So you cannot expect to be able to do proper government if you don't even have a list or, or um, a, an information system about these things. In the ideal world, you would have a lot of data about each one of these species. But we don't live in the, in the ideal world. Uh, I would love to be able to say like the, the Swedish or the Swiss they, they keep tracks of most species in their countries and they know the demography and they know the natural history and they have beautiful illustrations and systems and everything. But that's because they have a handful of species. Uh, if you live in, in a mega diverse country, um, which is two million square kilometers, it becomes difficult. So we didn't have most of this uh, information. Uh, fortunately, there are practical questions that do not require the entire all, all the information, all the details. You can do very practical things just knowing whether something is there or not. Presence, absence, matrices. You can, you, can, you can answer a lot of practical questions if you are capable of, of answering some person, yes, this species occurs where you are interested on, or no, probably it's not there. So that kind of whereabouts question, it's, it's very practical. And uh, you can answer those questions by using uh, the data in scientific collections. Because you go to scientific collections and the specimens have labels. And the labels have often a name and also uh, a description of where the specimen was captured. That description is the link to asking questions that are structured from a geographical perspective. And the name 
is a link to ask questions from different perspectives because the, the name gives you an entry point to the literature. So you can, by compiling, well, if you have just two or three or a dozen, it's not useful. But when you start compiling these things and you get, get into the hundreds of thousands or the millions, then you can see a bunch of statistical patterns and you can do a lot of modeling. So that was what we started doing. Why? Well, basically because we were following the, the path that the Australians started. Uh, by 1992, the Australians have a lot of, of uh, collections already computerized. Uh, they had developed, well, a lot of things, but uh, software to predict species distributions based on this data point that I have just uh, described uh, in, a, in a government agency. So this, these are points that uh, would correspond to so, some species, and the Australians developed software to go from the points to areas of distribution. So a mission of people from Conavio. Conavio was created in 1992, and basically what the government wanted was uh, uh, to know distributions of species for conservation purposes, mostly for conservation purposes. Um, these two are uh, species in the endangered species list of Mexico and they wanted to identify good places for conservation. Uh, they wanted to support the decision with good arguments because um, civil society was becoming increasingly vocal and well informed and as fast as possible, as always with government. So a mission of people from Colombia went to Australia to see what those guys were doing and uh, it was fantastic. So. Uh, immediately we wanted coming when, as soon as we came back we started trying to compile museum databases the electronic environmental layers which means that you at that time there were no climatic uh, electronic files everything was on paper so you had to start compiling those things and uh, we wanted to model species distributions see if it would be possible I, I thought it was going to be impossible I thought at that time that Australia was simple because it's, a, it's flat, and that Mexico was going to be very complicated because it's so mountainous. It turns out it's the other way around. The most mountainous is the better this, this, this software works. But, uh, and the other thing is that the Australians were using GARP. That's the name of the software. Uh, it, at that time, it ran in a supercomputer because desktops at that time were not as nearly as powerful as they are now. And that supercomputer was in the US, so you have to operate it via the internet. And at that time, nothing, this combination was really a killer. Every time someone from the government came to see what we were doing, because it was very, very mysterious, and I show them artificial intelligence, supercomputers, the internet, and these maps, uh, they gave you more money. It was, it was great. So what do you need? What you need is, the points, which come from the collections, the, the electronic layers, this is a temperature layer for Mexico, and the right software. It took some time and some money, but uh, after a few years, there were already 200,000. The, the database of birds, which was the first one, was about 200,000, and we had layers. And we were using the GARP software that the Australians uh, gave us. And immediately we started to get very nice results. Uh, this is a wrong name, but uh, this, is a, this is an endemic uh, uh, Rincopsita from Mexico, and this is one of the maps that was used to, to plan their, their conservation. Uh, it worked, and we were doing it for many species, but there were a bunch of problems. One is that GARP only worked in the, in the San Diego Supercomputer Center, although that was kind of sexy for a while. It was also very, very cumbersome. Uh, we were doing one simulation per species, and about every other fourth or fifth were very, very bad uh, predictions, really, really ugly and, and unrealistic. It took us some time to realize that you had to do an ensemble, many, many hundreds, and then take some sort of an average. It was very difficult to increase the grain of the resolutions to change the grain because the layers were in San Diego. 
So you wanted to change the grains, you have to go to San Diego and upload new, new layers. And it overpredicted. What is an overprediction here? This is an overprediction. This is a butterfly, a Baronia brevicornis. It's a swallowtail that doesn't look like one. Uh, uh, these are uh, data points from the collections, and this is the GARP output. So it, it makes plenty of sense here. It even makes sense here because there are subspecies of Baronia that occurs in this spot. So what about this or this or this? I mean, those were over predictions and it were annoying and people wanted to find better software. So look at this. This is trying to get a fix, which is a technological fix for a theoretical question. What are we modeling? This is the important question. This is the good question. It's an, an over prediction of what? This software, what it does actually? What's, what's uh, the, 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 the operations inside the computer? What are they doing? We hoped that it was an area of distribution. So what is an area of distribution? Well, uh, this is from a textbook about areas of distribution. It's uh, shadows produced by taxa on the geographical screen, and to study them, one needs to measure ghosts. That was not encouraging at all. Are we doing this, chasing ghosts? So that set us thinking. Meanwhile, the government kept asking questions, more and more questions, because we were providing some answers. So now the questions were different. We're not about conservation. They were about invasive species and, uh, and in, uh, permits for introduction uh, species to Mexico. For example, this is an old world pollinator. They wanted to introduce it. To, I mean, Mexico has like, I don't know how many species of, of, of bombus, but they wanted to introduce one from the old world. Was it going to be damaging? Probably. Uh, this is a miracle species, Sinara cardunculum. It's a, it's, it's, it's a thistle, and it's very, very, very invasive, also from the old world. And they wanted to introduce it to produce fiber. It would have escaped and probably caused very, very major damages. So they wanted to know whether it was risky or not to. And, and, and there were already invasive species reported, like Acoblastis cactorum, which is very famous. I'm not going to talk about Acoblastis cactorum, but it deserves an entire talk. Cactoblastis cactorum is from here. And if you do the model, that's what you get. So this is interesting. Uh, th this is the overprediction, right? But this is the overprediction if you are thinking about the area of distribution, the actual occupied area. But perhaps it's not an overprediction. This is what we really wanted to know. This is the prediction. The interesting part is this, that if you move, as what's happened, because at that time, Cactoblastis was already here established in Florida. And that's what started all this, the American government asking the Mexican government whether Cactoblastis was also reported in Mexico, because it's very damaging for, for a number of species. So uh, this was the Eureka moment, like this one, where someone realized that it's not, it's not the, the cube or the fourth power or some other power. Uh, perhaps we're modeling not areas, perhaps we're modeling niches. And it was so exciting. I remember the exact spot uh, we were talking about, Town, Town Peterson from the University of Kansas and myself, the precise spot where we said, hey, we are not modeling areas. We're modeling niches. This is what this software does. So what is a niche? OK, this is what the experts used to say. Um, it's probably very important, but we don't know what it is. OK? So we were back like, like the areas thing. What are niches and what are areas? And again, this was sort of uh, what we were doing, like alchemists. But this was very exciting because at this point, we really need to understand what was a distribution and what was a niche, driven by the applications, OK? Because we were getting questions all the time. And uh, also how they were related, because obviously there was some relation between the two. And moreover, uh, the algorithms were capturing something because the predictions were good. We were predicting, actually, 
uh, ahead of time whether you would find something or not in the field. Uh, and it was uh, basically kind of working. Uh, and moreover, whatever we were doing has to be explained to congresspersons, to ministers, and had to be practical enough as to be turned into legislation or budgets or permits. So it couldn't be really too abstract. It has to be operational. You should be able to do something specific with the data and, and use it for this kind of very practical things. So this is the f guy that started everything. Uh, Grinnell was uh, talking about niches in a certain sense that basically are related to the idea of distribution. So he was thinking geography when he was talking about niches. Also, he was thinking about several things, and it was nested, but uh, mostly about geography. But there was another niche. This is the Elton niche. And uh, this is what, uh, what are the effects of a species on others. And he used this silver, very, very famous uh, phrase. Uh, when you see an animal or an animal in a community, you should be able to say something like, there goes the vicar. This is a vicar, by the way, in case you never have seen one. Uh, when you see a predator, a badger, or a fox, you should be able to say that there's a fox, and you should know what it does in that community. That was the idea of Elton. Totally different from the idea of Grinnell. Completely different. Nevertheless, the two concepts got the same word, which is something that is annoying. Getting the same, the same. So it comes Hutchinson, very, very intelligent guy. Uh, he invented the multidimensional niche space in the famous paper of 1957. The idea of the fundamental niche, which we were talk, uh, listening about uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous talk, this is something related to the physiology of the species, the tolerance limits to, to, to environmental conditions. He invented the idea of realized niche, which means that the fundamental niche is reduced by interactions. Uh, he invented the idea that there is some sort of relation between niche space and the biotopes he, he, he used to, well, that's the word he used, it, which is what happens in, in, in geography. And in a later chapter, in a later, well, book, he also separated resources and conditions as niche variables. In this paper, they were mixed. So this is like a taxonomy of, of, of niches. I don't really want to go into the details because it will take me too much time. But what I want to say is that depending on how you answer different questions or whether you focus on impacts or on requirements or on both, whether you are looking at the local ecological scale or large biogeographical scales, join with different concepts. Chase and labeled, which is an inheritor of MacArthur and Van der Meer and others. Uh, uh, the Elton things that now are uh, discussed by Olin Smee in a very interesting book. Many concepts. The concept of niche I use is this one, which is basically geographic and about requirements. So please remember, this is important. When I use the term niche, I am using one of the many possibilities for interpretation niche. Uh, if, if, if you think that when I use niche is interchangeable to think of Elton or Grinnell, that's not true. I am thinking more about Elton, and this is what, what is here. Well, Hutchinson was really clever. He's one of my... Uh, uh, idols. Uh, he invented multivariate niche uh, space, fundamental realize, the duality of uh, environmental space and geographical space. Something that it took like, like almost uh, 40 years to be remembered. That is that there may be pieces of the fundamental niche that do not exist in a at a particular time in a particular space. Fundamental niches may be incomplete. And in this book, uh, something that nobody, almost nobody remember, which is synopoetic variables. Synopoetic variables are variables that are non-interactive. Uh, when you are, if, if the variable in your niche is something like seeds, 
and you are a bird, you are competing for those and you are depleting them. You are interacting dynamically with the source of your resource. Uh, Xenopoetic variables do not interact with you. You're, they're just like the scenario. That's where the terms come from. Uh, and mostly, there are, it's like climate. Um, you can, uh, they change at their own rates. Climate is changing with or without the monarch butterfly doing anything. Uh, coarse green, but mostly you get data for these variables and resolutions of more than one square kilometer. Climate topography, and there are lots of, I mean, it's terabytes of information about these things. This is the duality I was talking about. In geography, you just impose a grid of different resolutions. And for each element here, there is a climatic combination. This is an histogram of precipitation and uh, temperature. And so for each cell here, there is one combination. If you add enough variables and enough precision, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. For every cell here, there is just one cell here. Okay? What may happen, and it happens, is that some regions are more common. In this case, this region is dry and not too hot and not too uh, cold, which is temperate dry. So in North America, because this is for North America, this region is very, very common. This region is uncommon. This is the Chocó in Colombia. And this is the temperate uh, rainforest of, of uh, the British Columbia. So uh, what you have is, is, is uh, you can go from environmental space to geography using functions, mathematical functions, which are not equations, but you can implement those in the geographical information system. It doesn't matter that it's not a formula. It's a rule that can be repeated every time and you get the same result. So it's a function in, in the mathematical sense. And you can move from geography to environment and from environment to geography. And we were kind of beginning to see things clear. Perhaps, well, areas of distribution obviously were subsets of geography, niches were subsets of the environmental space, and you have an area which is suitable from, an, from the perspective of the fundamental niche, which is the, 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 the orange area here, but you have restricted movements, and that was the second part of the puzzle. If you are restricted in your movements, regardless of this being suitable, you are not going to be there. And that's, that's very much what, what happens. Uh, and when you start doing this kind of things with, with sets, you can start defining, you can start beginning to define uh, probabilities, calculating with probabilities, doing theory. So, this is a fundamental niche which is empty. But now it's occupied. Uh, imagine that you do horrible and cruel experiments with a, with a bug like this one. It's a tri triatomic uh, bug. And this is temperature and this is uh, um, humidity. And you find the region of the combinations of temperature and humidity where the bug can live. And you do this in the laboratory, OK? It has been done. With, with, with the water fleas, with Daphnia, with uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, with weevils, mostly with animals that people can torture in the lab without having um, a manifestation or a demonstration of uh, uh, people outside. So you get this thing. This is physiological. This is a fundamental niche. And they have more or less these shapes. Now, this is your uh, Hutchinson duality, geography and the corresponding environmental space today. This is changing. And since there are available uh, data sets for clim climate combinations in the past and in the future, you can actually see uh, how this is, is, is uh, the shape of that cloud changing all the time, okay? So this is what you see, the climates in the Western Hemisphere, and this is geography. Now. If you superimpose this in the same scale here, what you get is a region of the existing climate, which is inside the fundamental niche of this thing, okay? And the points, this is what Hutchinson realized. It hasn't to be completely packed with points. There may be areas which are empty. But whatever this, this ellipsoid catches here, you can project 
because of the operations I mentioned before, you can project in the geography, okay? So this red points here are here and here and here and here. This is where the actual bug leaves. That's uh, Piatoma Brasilensis. So this is an area which is suitable for the bug and also that has been accessible. The bug can move around, but they cannot reach this area of the world yet, despite the fact that the climate would be very good for them. There is also the interactions. I have not mentioned the interactions. Uh, perhaps the interactions, there, perhaps there are predators or competitors or something else that is preventing them to reach this area here, despite the fact that it's suitable from a climatic point of view and within reach. But perhaps there is a competitor there. I don't know. But uh, finally, what you get is that there are at least at least two interesting areas, one that you can invade and, that, and one that you occupy, and at least three different niches. So now you can talk about what the models are modeling, because now we have disentangled the entire, the entire problem into parts, constituent parts, and we can, uh, can understand how they relate to each other. So. What you want to model if you're interested in conservation is this area. What you want to model if you're interested in dispersal or invasive species is this area here. And to each one, you have different niches corresponding, okay? And you can do this probabilistically. And what is interesting is that the different models, the different algorithms, there are like 15 or 17, model different parts of the equations that relate those areas that I, that I have been mentioning. Uh, you're using uh, logistic regressions that a lot of people use. You need to have uh, absence data, but if you have absence data, you can use logistic regressions, and you're modeling the probability of presence, which is uh, what uh, your a conservationist want to model. If you don't have absence data, then you can use Bayes' theorem to model a related probability and that, uh, that is what Maxent and GARP and other methods uh, model. It's a very different thing. This is the probability of the species being present. This is the probability that given that you have observed the species, the climate is similar, which is a very different probability. Finally, if you are using what they are called envelope methods like BioClim or, or, or uh, Mahalanobis distances or, or, or vector machines, what you are obtaining is directly the subset, one subset inside the, the cloud that I showed. So different methods do different things. So we were uh, like 10 years working for the government and getting all these this questions, and uh, the questions were interesting, but also we had to report and, and ask for money and go to, to Congress and, and lobby them f to get the budgets and all that, which is really boring. Uh, at this point in time, we knew that uh, uh, presence-only algorithms model something related to the Grinnellian uh, realized niche that you can project this in geography and get something which is between the actual distribution and a potential distribution. Exactly where, you don't know unless you have more information. And the different algorithms model different things is not exactly what Hutchinson thought, because we, we morphed many of the ideas of Hutchinson. Uh, Hutchinson mixed variables. We were using only sinopoetic variables. Uh, the duality that Hutchinson was thinking about was local, and we were thinking about geography. Uh, he just had fundamental and realized, and, and we were using fundamental existing and realized. Uh, realized for Hutchinson is fundamental minus competition. For us is uh, fundamental minus negative interactors minus uh, non-accessible regions. Hutchinson did not have much data. We have tons of data. And he didn't have algorithms. Everything he did was graphical. No GIS, no geographical information systems. Nowadays we have very powerful GIS technology and a bunch of methods. Uh, this is like an idea of how it looks when you compile a uh, database. This is Plants of Mexico. It's, it's 1.3 million uh, records, so you can do a lot of modeling with this. 
back to the applications. By this time, 2005, this thing was booming, not only in Conabi, in Mexico. Ev everybody was doing uh, ecological niche modeling. And it was, be it was used for conservation, for vectors of human disease. Outbreaks of, of diseases were predicted using this, this methodology. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the red area was calculated by my colleague, Town Peterson. It's the area of distribution of suitability of uh, uh, Aedes albopictus, which is a mosquito that transmits a lot of encephalitis. It's original from Southeast Asia, but now it's in, in, in the US. And this is the predicted area. And the, ca the counties highlighted are the counties where uh, the health, uh, well, different states have reported the, the mosquito as present. So it's a very good prediction. And uh, in our case, the only, the one problem that we noticed is that the only user was the federal government. This kind of map is not useful for local users because it's, the resolution is too poor. The details that you require to model at a local level are related to habitat information and to interactions which were not included in this modeling. So this, this is a revelation, and I think this is very important. The questions, the data, and the method correspond naturally to users, and there are other users that are not, go not going to be interested in what you do. It's not, not useful to them. An example, uh, transgenic cotton. Transgenic cot cotton is very important. It's, it's, it's economically um, cheaper to grow this kind of cotton. But in Mexico, there are six species of, of wild uh, relatives of cotton. So in order to introduce, to plant transgenic cotton in Mexico, you have to show that there are no risks to, um, to um, uh, populations of wildlife relatives. The government gets the application of permits from the companies and they go to Conavio where there is a, a pipeline of, of uh, software which quickly calculates uh, the ecological model, check whether this is close, well this is close or close and this is far and far. And if it is close, it says you need to prove by field work that there are no local populations. If it is like this one, you say go ahead, plant whatever you want. And the companies are very happy, and Greenpeace is very happy, because we have to negotiate this with both the, the companies and the NGOs that are against uh, transgenic uh, crops. This is another nicer. There are many varieties of mezcals in Mexico, and mostly because they are produced with different species of agave. Okay? So in order to, to provide origin denominations for the mezcals, uh, niche modeling is being done of the different species. So depending on that, you will be able to have your own brand of mezcal, and it's done with niche modeling, which is based on herbarium specimens. Who would have believed that not long ago? And we had some sort of a theory. The theory has several components. It has definitions, like this one. What is an area of distribution? It's a subset of a grid. Subset of a grid defined by a species, okay? We have niche uh, definitions, which are subsets of environmental space. This is a fundamental niche. Inside, you can see in red the existing uh, points that are inside that, that thing. We have data, um, occurrences, and layers. Now we have GBIF that at that time did not exist. GBIF now it's distributing uh, about almost 400 uh, million uh, occurrence records nowadays from, from all over the world. This is a map, well, from, from all over the world, many from Europe and from North America, including Mexico. Uh, Costa Rica uh, contributes a lot, and there are areas of the world with very, very little uh, data contributed. But still, it's 400 million records, it's a lot. And of course, you have all the data, which is climatic data, or the data that from remote sensing that you can use, which accumulates in the order of terabytes per year. <coughs> and we have models. I'm not going to get too much into this detail. But this is the sort of model we do. And each pixel is big. And the pixels we meet are 10 by 10 kilometers. So this is the area of distribution of a bird. It's an, it's an Oriole. 
and each one of the pixels is at 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers pixel. So that means 100 square kilometers, which means about um, uh, 10,000 uh, uh, hectares, about 20,000 acres. So a pixel here measures 20,000 acres. So inside 20,000 acres, a lot of habitat, a lot of interactions, the details may be different and change. Even in Texas, if you have a spread of 20,000 acres, you're not bad. So uh, I think that this, this illustrates very well what you're talking about. For a rancher, it's one pixel. So this model is irrelevant, basically. But for a federal government, it's very useful. We have now hypotheses relating the definitions. I am not going to stay much longer here, but the fundamental niche contains the existing niche, which contains whatever your model estimates, and that probably contains the realized niche. This is a hypothesis that we have relating the different definitions. And I have a PhD student now uh, finding the very difficult data about the fundamental niche to do the entire thing and check whether this hypothesis is actually consistent with the data or not. We have a number of probability equations now relating the different concepts. Um, and now we have also hypotheses about mechanisms, because everything that I have shown is static and based on correlations. That's never enough. You want to have mechanisms and how they work. So this is, uh, an, uh, this is a model of a fundamental niche. This is a, a diagonal matrix that expresses how far the climate in a cell departs from the fundamental niche of a given species. And we have a simple equation that relates uh, movements. It's a matrix defining what cells are reachable from other cells. It's called an adjacency matrix. This is the matrix that defines how far your the climate in a given cell is different from the fundamental niche. And these are columns in the presence absence matrix that we saw in the, in the previous uh, talk. It's just a column of zeros and ones. You begin with an area of distribution and you see how, how, what other cells are reachable and then you test for suitability. And if everything is okay, you get the area of distribution in the next uh, time iteration. Uh, this all has a lot of assumptions uh, that it's Gleasonian, that there are no interactions, which is, it's explicit. We are explicitly saying there are no interactions. The interactions does not matter at this scale. And that's an empirical, testable uh, assumption. And we are also assuming that the fundamental niche is constant doesn't evolve, which I call the Kansas model. No evolution in the <laughs> fundamental niche. So, and when you integrate, what you see is this, this kind of thing. This is the area of distribution from the, place, from the mac gla glacial maximum to the present of a Pelocoma terulescence being integrated over 1,000 uh, years uh, steps. So, those equations that I show, this, this thing, is not really an equation. It's a recipe to operate with objects. Uh, this, the, the area of distributions are vectors of zeros and ones that in this case measure about nearly, well, more than seven million uh, zeros and or ones. Uh, the, this thing that is related to, to climate, in order to do, to do the simulation from the place to scene, you have to assemble 270 files, each one changing the, 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 the climate in steps of, I think it was 5,000 years for several variables. And the, the, the adjacency matrix is, is obscenely huge and you cannot uh, uh, manage it as, as a matrix. You have to use software techniques in order to, to manage it. So this is, looks like an equation, but it's not an equation. It's, it's the description of something you do with the data. If you try to add evolution, then the thing really gets hairy. And, uh, and we have not yet been able to, to publish this paper. Some referees think that 
this is uh, the 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 deduction of these equations is 15 pages of algebra and and nobody's going to review that. Uh, and I didn't do it myself. I I had a postdoctoral uh, associate, which is a mathematician, and he he solved this 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 problem. And finally, as I said before, there are dozens of methods. And there is something very interesting. You can get the predictions without really understanding anything. And this is, this is something really worrisome. That's what we started doing at the beginning. We were garping data and producing maps that were very nice looking, so everybody was impressed. And we didn't know what we were doing. And I am afraid that with the, ex the explosion of this field, that still is going on. The other thing that we learned is that there is no silver bullet. Some methods work well for certain problems, and other methods work well for other problems. So Maxent is not a silver bullet. It depends on your problem. Uh, so I hope I convinced you that applications led to theory in this particular uh, example. Uh, Remember what I said by theory. It's not necessarily a single equation. It's, it's the entire structure of thinking. It's, it's, it's your definitions, your hypothesis, your models, your concepts, your, your, your formalization. Uh, it's not like the theory of everything that they are looking for in physics. It's not a single equation. And there are many challenges. Um, climate change. Climate change means that the structure of the environment is changing and you get new combinations that were not existing before. So what's, what's the meaning of that? Uh, it's not just that you are inside the ranges, but the, the combinations may change very, very drastically. So how that works, I don't know. Uh, if you want to transfer environmental structure, you have some problems that we have not solved. If you want to increase the resolution, which is very important because there are stakeholders demanding more resolution, we will have to modify the entire theory to include habitat and interactions. Uh, we would like to, to do applications in phylogeography, in phylogenetics, and model thousands of species. Each column, that G vector that I showed, is one column in the presence absence matrix. If you want to model large communities, you will have hundreds or perhaps thousands of columns and very large presence absence matrices, very, very large. Those are practical questions, but they're also theoretical questions. Uh, we really need to keep working on this process-oriented modeling, include biotic interactions. This is uh, one of the holy grails of this entire thing on evolution. And this is a personal one. I still don't know what is the fundamental niche. I showed you many. Uh, of the ellipsoid and, and, and points inside, but I don't think that's true. I think that fundamental niches are more like trajectories. And that's, that's a nice theoretical question. What is a fundamental niche uh, in terms of, the original ideas were Hutchinson's, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So, very real users started asking questions to biodiversity scientists in Mexico, and this, started a process of developing everything that I showed. Uh, and what I showed is useful at certain scales, but not at other scales. Scale means not only if you're measuring things in terms of hundreds of thousands of kilometers or millions or tens or one, means also that you change the user. And when you change the user, you change the, what matters to the person, you change the values probably, you change even the language, if you are speaking with indigenous communities for instance, uh, tons of things change. It's very important to know at what scale what you do is relevant for, for what people. And um, we mostly move from applications to theory, which is not a lot of people think that this is the other way around, that you begin with the theory and then go and look for applications. In this case, it was the other way around. Uh, we were borrowing from amazing pioneers, really people like Hutchinson, Grinnell, uh, Van der Meer, many uh, very, very uh, good pioneers in this thing. But there was a lot of new stuff. And most of what was new 
was driven by the applications. Uh, and of course, one has a lot of uh, people to say thank you to. Uh, I am very grateful to, to these people, to the taxpayers of Mexico, a poor country that still managed to, to contribute tens of millions of dollars to compiling databases and to us buy good computers and clusters and everything that they did. And also supported, they've been supporting for hundreds, more than 100 years, the museums in Mexico that started all this. Uh, and of course, the taxpayers that are now paying my own salary now that I am here in, well, there in Kansas. Because when I was hired, the guy that hired me, I asked, well, what do you expect me to do? And he said, whatever you like. And what, I mean, a scientist really like that kind of an answer. Uh, I like the, to they say thank you to the museums that share the data freely. That was not the case in the 90s. It took a lot of convincing. Now people share the data. And of course, the students and the colleagues and all the people that have provided uh, money for this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Severon. And we have time for a couple of questions. I was intrigued by your comment at the very end about the fundamental niche as trajectories. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. If you, th the definition of, of a fundamental niche is the set of conditions where the, the intrinsic growth rate is positive. But the intrinsic growth rate is, is calculated from, from a matrix of the different stages. And it's, you, you need to be in the right combination for every stage. And perhaps some stages have different requirements. In fact, many do. It's been known since a long time. Uh, what you need to, to, if you're a seed, what you need to sprout may be very different from what you need just to stay there, and maybe different from what you need to produce new seed. So th uh, that, that is a trajectory. You have to fulfill the conditions of each stage at the right period. And that's what I mean. Um, two, two interacting concepts here. One, one is that, that as, you, as you add more, uh, let's say, environmental dimensions to your calculation of niche space, um, how we're defined, um, it actually gets smaller. And so if you're looking at temperature and precipitation, you add a third axis, there's fewer temperature and precipitation points that would fit it based upon a third of whatever that might be. So your, your um, Fundamental niche is a fundamental niche based on two, not the fundamental niche. So it's always an overestimate in a sense. But given that, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of stuff, especially in the popular literature, is about the, um, with the data explosion, that we'll have so much information out there, we will no longer need models. We will have data. And data will tell us the answer because they never lie. Uh, so juxtapositioning those two points, uh, what would you say about the future sort of a biodiversity modeling, given that we probably will have tons more data to inform our sort of estimates of the niche? That's an excellent question. I think that's one of the main differences with this kind of theoretical approach and some more classic, more physical approaches. And it's capturing what I said about that um, equation not being an equation. If, if, if in physics, or imagine the, the, the species area equation, the two parameters are two numbers that aim to capture an enormous complexity. The equivalent equation would be the union of, the, of each one of the species model independently, and it would have thousands of parameters. It's, it's that, in that, uh, I accept the idea that data should drive theories in that sense, not in the sense that you do mindless uh, things and just uh, expect uh, the, 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 the computer to find you the patterns. You need to think and you need to have ideas. It's unavoidable. And if you don't do that, then you are just in the hands of, uh, well, in the hands of the machine and, and mostly you are going to get uh, problems. You started asking what happens with the fundamental niche when you add variables. Of course, you reduce it. So modeling with 20 variables 
or with many thousands, as someone has actually advocated in a book that is published, it's a big mistake. You are basically just embracing the data. You have to use a reasonable amount. What's reasonable, well, depends on whether you're modeling bats or butterflies or other things. You need to, I really need, think that you need to, to, to conceptualize and to think, but on, at the same time, I think that this field and others are going to be driven by this data availability to a, to, to a larger and larger extent. It's called the fourth paradigm, I think, by, by computer scientists. Um, were you guys ever able to estimate a dollar amount that Colonel Bio saved the Mexican people by you know, preventing the introduction of all of these tests? It seems like a great opportunity to tell people the actual dollar worth of the natural history collection. That's a great question, and the honest answer is no. And this would be like the counterfactual analysis that Tom was uh, describing this morning. We never did that. Uh, we had the Ministry of the Treasury that was giving us the money, and they wanted one single indicator of what we were doing. And I was like foaming, because how can you describe this with one single indicator, right? Well, the single indicator we used was how often there were consults made by other government agencies to this database. That was a single indicator, which is fair enough. But I would have loved to be able to say, uh, Mexico is saving this amount of money because of this system. I have no idea. It's, it's a difficult question. And probably there were no, no methods at that time. Perhaps there are methods now. I took a lot of notes when you were talking this morning. If I could have all of the speakers come up, it's uh, time for our panel discussion. Um, so if you still if you still have questions, you'll have an opportunity to ask them. I'm just going to drop things all over the floor. Let's, let's thank Dr. Soberon one last oh, time. Oh yeah, sorry.